our college presentation. STEM is an acronym that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Today's presentation is going to be at Turnkite College Northeast Campus and provided by the Digital Dean of Science and Technology, Charlene Colt. heard about it and being a biologist I was very skeptical <laughs> because it talked about moving the walls and trans multidisciplinary study practices and I thought oh, this is soft stuff <laughs> I have too much time to put emphasis on what students need to learn then uh, Dr. De La Teja uh, invited me to attend a conference um, that was the at an institution community college with tech Community College <laughs> that actually uh, are employing these this future forward look at at the uh, this future forward program. So as I was there, I was fortunate enough to be placed in a group with a person that was a physicist and a chemist, and I started to look at how they worked that program, and I thought, hey, this is possible. This is doable. So I keep this all the time. So if anyone wants a, a more thorough look at it at some point, it's in my office. I keep it on the table for you to take a look at. So let's talk about this. The important thing about uh, this whole process is that we're preparing students for jobs of the future. Now, one of the things that came from that presentation was these, what they call weak signals. So the majority of the time what we look at is what's going on now. But this is actually forcing people to think about what will be needed in 2060. Of course, I'm not worried about that because I'll be deceased. <laughs> That's not my age. But in 2060, what's going on? How will, we be how will we teach labs and things of this nature? So the Future Forward College compels educators and institutions to examine the impact of technology, innovation, and an increase in interconnected world in shaping learners and the learning process. So I'm no longer just stuck in my classroom at Tarrant County College and limited to what I have here. You know, the world, world Wide Web, I can be in communication with someone in England discussing a project that I'm, I'm, I am working on. So that's an important thing. So our learners today are not restricted. So that's where we have to come out of our silo. Recognize a transition from access, that's to community college and higher education, to emphasis on completion, success, performance, and employment, generating a rethinking of curriculum and pedagogy. How do we set up the curriculum? How do we implement that curriculum in this modern world and these modern learners. So we are really being forced to do this. We get the students in. How do we get them through the programs with their A's? You know, all of you want all A's. How do we get you through the program in a timely fashion and exit the institution? And, and we have done what we were supposed to. Consider a multidisciplinary approach to instruction. Conduct, conduct, oh, connecting academic silos. Uh-oh. I stayed on this campus I don't know how many years. And I was a biology faculty. Someone would ask me about another building on this campus, and I would look at them like, what are you talking about? I drove my car up, I parked in 
in the parking lot. I went in the science building, NSCW, NSCE, and that was my world. Every now and then I would come out if someone asked me to go to a meeting. But was I concerned about what they were doing in English? Was I concerned about what they were doing in sociology? No, I wasn't. I'm just in my own little world. And by the way, we're good at doing that in the science field, in the STEM areas. And this is the part probably is the most difficult for me. And this is going to require a lot of critical thinking. Preparing students for jobs that do not exist at the current. Now that's future forward thinking. What jobs will be available in 2030? And those types of so now we got a mindset. We've got to think futuristically. Uh oh, futuristically, we must think futuristically in order to tackle those kinds of problems. Competitive attributes required for the future. Ability to work in teams. Ability to work in teams. Now, what is it different now? How many of you are in science classes? Chemistry, biology, and for some of those. Well, you're kind of used to working in teams because you go to a lab, you're in a lab room. That's a team. But now I need you to move apart from that and say that now you're going to work on a project with somebody that is a sociology major, someone that is a history major, and someone that is an English major. But you're going to work on the same project. So that's teamwork and collaborative work. Possess a creative mind. If you are just limited to what you know, you've got to move out of that. You must move out of that arena and start thinking about a creative mind. What if? <laughs> How will this work if I do this? When I alter a situation and not be afraid to do so, you know, not to be afraid to do so, because that's how we learn. I altered, made a mistake, and you say, oops, not a good technique to use. So we want you to open your mind when we say possess a creative mind. Problem solving skills, important. You have to know something, but you need to be able to solve problems and not say, well, what are the steps? <laughs> Give me these steps. You're creating the steps. You're creating the solution. You're creating the solution. Innovative thought process. That means bringing things into the future, even before they get there. Many of you know that we had a 3D printing workshop on last Friday. So when I think about the 3D printing, we are a little bit behind, because that is not the future, it is the current. So now our new question is, what will 3D printing or what type of printing will exist in another decade? Because that will become old news. We will train people for a period of time, but they must also move forward in what they're going to do. So we coined this term, what is multidisciplinary learning, or multidisciplinary learning. And that's where we're going to bring things into. Sometimes when I was in the classroom, I always gave these discussion problem solution questions on my exams. And then I go through and I start correcting the grammar on it. And so one student said, this is not an English class. And I said, but you must communicate your thoughts and your results using the King's English. <laughs> so it behooves you to be able to do that well. So don't get upset when your instructors take off for things like spelling. I want to dis, uh, mystify the fact that Multidisciplinary learning is truly an authentic one. It's not inauthentic. It is also relevant. It is not fluffy. It's not touchy-feely. It's authentic and it's relevant. Enriched and supported by traditional learning. Now, this is where we have to get the, that, that real tight kind of line on where we cross. Unfortunately for me, I'm just telling you, this is a personal opinion of mine, that it's difficult to think critically sometimes when you don't have the least foundation to start. So no matter how we open up the walls in the sciences, 
there must be some fundamental concepts that students are exposed to in the classroom so that they can use that foundation to think kind of critically. Now, how does this look in the, in the classroom environment? Um, I may not be so concerned with you being able to label at one particular time every part of a cell. But I may be willing to understand that you know how this thing works. When I think critically, I'm looking at how does this one little cell in my liver behaves like a total multicellular organism? It's respiring. In the system, we call it breathing. It's making decisions. In our system, it's our brain. But at the cellular level, the tissue is making a decision. You said, how do you know? Well, implant the wrong organ, yes, right, organ into someone's system, and it'll say, if you put it in the wrong place, it'll say, I'm not a liver, you're not a liver. And if you are a liver, it'll say to it, ah, you are not the liver that was produced by this body, I will reject you. <laughs> and that's it, so I think, my, this is a cell doing that kind of stuff. And homeo sapiens sapien, more than man, the most intellectual evolutionary creature, cannot sometimes make those kind of decisions. Enriched and supported by traditional learning. Specific discipline learning is not compartmentalized. It is not compartmentalized. I was taught that, you know, I wasn't concerned about anything else, as I said earlier. I just wanted to learn all my chemistry, my biology, and whatever. Didn't give a flip about the other stuff. <laughs> then we talk about intra versus interdisciplinary. Intradisciplinary. I would spend times in my lecture talking about the relationship between biology, chemistry, physics, and even sometimes geology especially when I was trying to describe the origin of multicellular, multicellular organisms. And, and so the students would look at me like I'm crazy, <laughs> and I would bring in physics. And I would start from that point, energy fields, that become such things as mass with them. We get electrons, protons, and neutrons. And then we build those rascals into something that we call what? An atom. The atom then begin to interface with each other and form a molecule. And as we form the molecules, I got happy. I did a happy dance. Because the only molecules that I was really interested in at that time was some group that's called organic. And of the organic molecules, the only thing that I was concerned about, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, DNA, because that's where life is on that part. So interdisciplinary. Now let's look at this, interdisciplinary. Now I'm asking biology, chemistry, art, and maybe sociology to come together in a learning environment. Crazy. Think about that. Sociology, history. What, how do we bring those into the picture? You know? Government. Last Friday, they were talking about the production of skin. Skin. Using 3D printing and using cellular components. So you say, well, that's it, that's pure science. I said, it, it can become political. <coughs> it can be from a legal standpoint. Ask some of these people that, when we looked at the first in vitro fertilizations, then the couple got a divorce, and they had all these sales pros, <laughs> and now we have to deal with legal issues about what are the ramifications. So a person that's a pre-law major can become informed and use that as a, as a tool. So now we're looking at these emerging fields, and some of them are, have emerged, but in biology, we, I used to be, when I did biology as an undergrad, it was just learn the parts or whatever. We did not do a whole lot of statistical analysis of our results. It was a positive analysis. So now we look at biostat, biochemistry, and here's the hot one right now, Bioinformatics. The first time I introduced that about two years ago, somebody said, what is bioinformatics? You can get a PhD now in bioinformatics. The first time I, I was introduced to it um, as a person that was hired for that with the Texas Women's University, 
and they have hired a professor that's all he does in the analyzing of data. He does some research, but it's bioinformatics. Bioinformatics. It's having a strong computer background in mathematics. Biophysics. People don't think about biophysics. But there is a such career that's called biophysics and psychology. Psychology has always been tied in with the biology standpoint. We call it clinical psychology or one of the other. Then we have what we call math. And look, this just get all intertwined here. So, so the next time you wonder why somebody put a prerequisite on your chemistry class that you said that you had to have completed college algebra or they put a prerequisite because they're intertwined. You're not gonna be able to do a whole lot of physics if you don't have good math skills. We are also telling you that we talk about chemical physics. Chemical physics? What the heck is chemical physics? We come in and pick up biochemistry again. The biology, the medicine, geology, here. In fact, we tell you now that in the medicinal world, diseases are actually diagnosed at the chemistry level. We tied in with dogs and stuff. We said that a dog can now sniff and tell, I just saw where they can detect now high blood glucose level. So the biologist said, how in the world can that happen? <coughs> well, there's a chemical molecule in the nasal passageway, passageway of the dog that is called a chemoreceptor, a chemical receptor. It's a protein. It's a chemical molecule that tells us what we smell. This is computer science, and it got so expensive, I don't know what to do with that. But we have software engineering, databases here, bioinformatics come up again. Information security is something that we work with here at Tarrant County College. Um, the whole thing about computer science, though, you get a couple of certifications, and someone is willing to pay you $50,000, $60,000. You don't have an associate degree. <laughs> you just have a certification. So what happens when our computer science majors move into that area and they get that certification and somebody say, I want to hire you and I'm going to pay you 60 or 70,000 starting salary. And then you look at the lowly PhD. <laughs> Spent all those years in college and then they come out and they get their first job, had to do a postdoc and all of that. And they may not start at that salary. You're looking at someone that is no degree, but a certification that starts that. So I go back and say that. Beyond the academic STEM, this is where we are. Common characteristics of a well-designed STEM program, it needs to be both multidisciplinary and integrated. Provide a focus on critical thinking, problem solving, and here comes the DD, collaboration and communication. Now, Dr. Goldman has brought on what we call these task teams uh, within the, the campus itself. And one of those things is, is that we're looking at task teams talking to each other to a great extent. I'm building a lab facility over in, in the science building. How is this going to impact our uh, student support services? Should we merge those closely? So this is the type of creative thinking that we need to do. Now here's, you, got, you guys have a sheet of paper there. And for all of my faculty members, you're going to pretend like this is the first time you've ever heard of anything on this sheet, and you're going to work in a group collaboratively. Okay, so let's take a look at this STEM, an interdisciplinary approach to education. And I use such things as photography, art, English, sociology, government. Then I came back and looked at this continual interconnecting that occurs here. It says science, and that, keep, that gives us all our biology, chemistry, physics, and those. Humanities, social and behavioral sciences. I was at from Wake Tech too. We got a copy of Seeing More Colors. And when I first opened it up, they had all these beautiful photos in here. You see those images? And then I looked at who was the author on this. It says Michael S. Lewis, MD. That's seeing the science in everything that he looks at. So if you want to take a look at that. Then I was at a STEM conference back in uh, September, and I was walking around, and it says 2019 
League for Innovation Student Art Competition hosted by Lane Community College. And then I got a little bit upset too, because as I went through this, these were awards given. And in the awards part, our sister college, Dallas Community College. Dallas Community College. And I got, what? At a STEM conference, <laughs> photography. So they've got it already. They've gotten it. They said that we can do photography as it explores the STEM areas, combining the two. So here's the little worksheet that I have. The first one is the critical thinking. So you can't use your phones to get out there real quickly and Google what this condition is. But we're gonna watch how you can use critical thinking and develop uh, a kind of Okay, so the first thing that I want you to do is just, let's see what organ is very easy to draw. It says, use the limited script below to develop a multidisciplinary approach to the study of amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is a condition, that's all you can put in, in which an abnormal protein, so I would circle that abnormal protein. So that's my first thing, is the protein has gone from something that should have been normal to something that is what? Abnormal. Call an amyloid. It builds up in your tissues and organs. When it does, it affects the shape and how they work. Amyloidosis is a series of health problems that can lead to life-threatening organ failure. The reason why I chose this because in uh, 2007, diagnosed in 2000, my brother, senior brother Albert, was diagnosed with amyloidosis. Threw everybody for, they didn't know what it was. So you know, the first thing I did was to get on the computer and try to get some information on it. And it said the life expectancy was five years. He lived seven and so I was really, we were elated with some <coughs> different techniques. So this is kind of interesting. So what I want you to do, um, everybody pretty much knows what a kidney is shaped like, right? Mm -hmm. So let's take this kidney, let's draw a kidney. Let's draw a kidney, your last drawing of a kidney. Now, from the art student perspective, if I had an art, an art student in here, that kidney would be drawn to perfection, correct? <laughs> Your kidneys probably look a little bit this, but I got different examples. Can I see yours? Sure. This is the diversity. One kidney. And guess what? I can see a kidney, right? Does anyone else have anything else? Okay, kidney. Now notice what this part is. Now I want you to give your protein, this amyloid protein, any shape you want to. You want to call this one your control. This is the normal shape. So draw a shape for your amyloid protein. Not a passage in the right. Huh? The passage in the right. Just draw it separately. Yeah. This is your norm. This is what you're going to consider norm. You have no idea what it looks like, right? Now the next thing you're going to do is to draw an arrow. When you draw the arrow, you're going to malform your protein. I don't care what shape you make it, make it a different shape. Make it a different shape. Can you say that again, Dean Cole? I want you to draw, take an arrow and draw a malformed protein. Your protein, make it st stupid. It, it lost its shape and went into any kind of shape <laughs> you wanted to go to. Got it? Now this is, the, this is the critical thinking. This is the analytical process. Your for, first drawing of your protein created your nice, well-formed kidney. It created the nice boundaries on your kidney and all of that. So now what you have to imagine is this. What will the new shape do to your kidney? And I would say just go to the periphery. And imagine that protein with its new bent out of shape morphology, what would it do to that smooth line that you have on your kidney? Yeah, 
just in your mind, how would that alter the shape of your kidney? Yeah, somewhere it will. For those of you that have ever, how many of you have heard of a condition called sickle cell anemia? It takes the red blood cell that normally are a nice, beautiful, by this like shape, and when it contorts it, we immediately see, in our mind, it didn't take, when you have to study, five hours to know that, that if I have a small vessel that is this size, where that red blood cell can roll through it, when I create this crescent shape, two can come together, hang up. If I get too many of them hanging up like that, what's gonna happen? That's right, Christ. People, that's critical thinking. That's critical thinking. That's application. You didn't have to know anything about that to create that unit. I'm watching my time. This is what one drawing of the amyloid protein is. I could have been in, I could have done this in an art class and asked everyone in that art, those art students to draw me your image of what that protein is. If you're in computer science these days, in the biology realms, you create software to ask the question, what are the, based on the amino acid that makes up this protein, what are the possible folding patterns that it can go into? We can't predict them exactly, but we can come close to it. And the computer will say, there are 20 different, a uh, thousand different possible models. Nature has it best though because nature's been doing it a long time. It knows exactly how the process is supposed to fold. But when something doesn't fold right, we do know this. Cause and what? Effect. Ooh, cause, that's what's that, cause and effect. I didn't get the results like I thought they should have been. What was the cause? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you wanna ask? What caused, I don't know what caused it, but I, just maybe it was DNA or genetics or and so guess what you open up a whole realm of study research you don't know exactly you can predict what it could have been but you're ready to start looking at it so from a sociological standpoint a sociology standpoint we can ask the question <laughs> is amyloid amyloidosis unique to a geographical area or to a culture Ooh. And if it is unique to a culture, is, are there outside environmental factors that may encourage the formation of these male proteins? We call them mutations. So now we're asking, what are the long-term effects of all that lead in that water, in whatever state that was, over the water? We don't know what the outcome effects will be. So here it is, here's the protein. Now someone had to come in and say, that all this kind of stuff is amino acids, we learn all that stuff and some other thing. And then it has this unique little pattern here and a unique little pattern here. One of the things that they found out, which is also very, very common in my father's side of the family. There were 13 of them. My father is 92 years old and he suffers from Alzheimer's. The, um, all the siblings that I knew growing up, my aunt, all died from it. Al died from a different form of that, and they found this out. It's that amyloid protein. It's that amyloid protein. It's that amyloid protein. Al started in his pancreas. Soft tissue, he loves soft tissues. Start malfunctioning, his pancreas starts to malfunction. But this vessel can get into through a neurological system, and they create these things called plaques. Okay? They create these things that's called plaques. The biologist thinks about this. We look at these classical little neurons. We love to use this one as a classical example of the neuron, you know? <coughs> they're sensory neurons, motor neurons, yada, yada. And then that's in what they call glial cells. But there are communications going here. Now, you can't see it very well, but there's a little prong that's coming out here, dendrite. And imagine if this is supposed to interface here, and this plaque 
gets in the middle of it. Example, I have a water hose. And a plug gets in the middle of my water hose. I don't care how much water I'm trying to push through that hose, it's not going to exit out of the what? Of the end. Uh-oh. Sometimes it may see through. But these plaques, one of the leading causes of dementia are these amyloid plaques. And amyloid plaques, these amyloid proteins have a lot of what we call sugar molecules on the end of it. So if you ever think about sugar in water, the more saturated it gets, what happens? What's, a, what's an example of saturated sugar water? I like being, I like being, uh, you know, sometimes I joke about it. I'm a native Mississippian that came from a very um, rural environment. So sometimes we would buy out of the thing called molasses or syrup. And my mom would make this thing. What she would do is to put sugar in the water and boil it to the point that the water evaporates, it becomes condensed enough to pour over. It was clear, but if you really want to give it some color, you kind of burn the sugar before you put the water in it. <laughs> you swatch it a little bit, you put the water in, you boil it down, you got the what? So, concentrated sugar water can be syrup. Think about all these highly polarized molecules stacking up like that. They start interacting with neurotransmitters and stuff is just not firing up right. That's all it is. That's all it is. So, we brought in art. Sketching to design your image of what, a, what uh, an amyloid should look like. Create all the images you want. We brought in sociology, looking at where these originated, uh, the highest incidence of amyloids. Can it be related to some type of environmental or food, product, uh, food acquisition that occurs in that area? You can even bring it in history. Someone can do a paper. So if I had a biology or chemistry student that was enrolled in a history class, and I had to write a paper, guess what I would write my paper on? The historical perspective of the identification of amyloid what? Proteins. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. That's cross crossing into multidisciplinary. If I had to give a speech, in this day, guess what my speech would be on? Is amyloid, amyloidosis from a, a sociologist, is it more common in Caucasian, Native American, African American, Asian In what population is it most commonly found? Uh-oh, so I'm expanding that. And believe me, you can't write a paper on something if you don't take the time to learn what you're writing on. You may not be able to understand the chemistry of it, but you will have an idea. So where are the job potentials? Of course, three key technologies here. Astrophysics. And this is one that sometimes people forget. Science photographers. People that go out and take those pictures. I located Izzo, who works with NASA in Maryland, the station there. He is actually an engineer, but has a very sharp eye in the art and has helped predict or uh, take images and, and, and scan them into the computer to say, here are the images coming back, let's see what, what they could potentially be. Science illustrators. Once I was in a classroom and um, I was lecturing, and I walked over to the student's lecture notes, and her drawings were immaculate. Even in the point that we had some errors in our lab manual when we were using them back then, because something was mislabeled. That is because that was an artist's biology background. 
But if you're a biology background, anatomy and physiology background, scientist as such, you can make sure that illustrations are indeed correct, even if they're computer generated. You go in and you screen for that. That's another job opportunity. I'm interested in this one. Have been for a while. Since I'm no longer in the classroom, I can't do it. Gamification. I think this is, I don't play any games, Dr. Craig. I do not play any type of computer game. <laughs> I know he's gonna, that's what my son does to me too. He goes, oh, and my grandson now. But I'm looking at that, and I want, as a project, some biology student to even actually earn your, produce your own income. There's a process that's called endocytic trafficking. And by the way, the, those amyloid proteins are kind of tied in there. We call it also endocytic trafficking, and then it's associated with DNA replication, transcription, translation. We can also talk about it being associated with antibody formation. You heard of antibodies. I got these antibodies. So I would like to have a student to create a game where they can look at all the potential things that would stop that messenger RNA from even identifying the gene, one level. <laughs> then after we get it there, how many biologists do I have? Do I have any biologists in here? Ah. And then there's that thing that's called, before it gets out of the nucleus, for you, most of it has to go through a post-transcriptional modification, where all these little things have to get activated to make sure it's right. So the student learns because they have to understand the process. They have to look at all these things that can attack it, and they move to level two. <laughs> level three, there's another barrage of different activity can happen. So their skills and their understanding of the process, they get to level four. You're top notch when you get that antibody <laughs> through the whole process and either stick it on the cell are sent it out as a free-floating antibody. If you can do that, you're untouchable. You're untouchable. So we've used gamification, so I would tie that student with someone in computer science <laughs> who's a programmer, because I got a programmer that has to write that program for that activity at each step. I'm only trying to get to you future forward. You are not studying in a silo. You're going to start embracing your peers across the campuses and discipline. I had a best friend, let's write this paper. What's the difference between the writing of a scientific paper versus one that you do in your English classes or other things? Learn those when you teach and learn all this stuff. I've listed, if you want this, and anyone that, that signed up, I'll send it. These are come, some of the um, different um, website that you can go to, and this way, Tech is an excellent one. If you're a faculty member and you really want to know what's happening, go to that website. And look at that. So if you sign up and you want it, just tell me and I'll, I'll send it to you on that part. And they're doing some great things, some great things at, at Wake Tech, and that's a good one. Future Forward College is simply uh, saying to us, take off the blinders and understand that we do not work in silos, that we are beginning to work together in a collaborative manner to make sure that our students and that you are well prepared to move forward and transfer or to go directly into the workforce as such. That is it, any questions? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> are there, yes? I was just gonna make a comment, um, and that is, um, I like to be research um, um, on the future. And one of the things that I found is in uh, looking at uh, how everyone is performing across our world, not just in the United States, across our world, basically what the conclusion is, is that uh, for our future um, and for our present as well, it's really not what you know that counts, it's what you can do with what you know. So when you are studying or, or you're a teacher, um, what we need to understand 
uh, is that it's not about memorizing at all. And that's what she's trying to say. Uh, it's about using your creative mind and making connections between information that you may have learned in your art class and use it when you're in your biology class or vice versa. Um, and, and being really open to those ideas uh, and making those connections. And that is what is really needed uh, into the future because most of us you know, went on and got their, our doctorates, et cetera. We don't remember specifically what we learned in that biology class, but what we learned were the critical thinking skills. We learned the problem solving skills. The other thing that we learned is how to work with each other. Uh, because if you uh, are in a silo and haven't learned how to work with colleagues from different backgrounds um, and really pay attention to what they are saying and, and taking that information and then valuing it, uh, then you're not gonna be as valuable in the workforce uh, or even, I might say, in your own families, uh, because we have uh, all kinds of structures that we work in, including our own families. So I just wanted to, to say that. And you know, even as, as I look back over my transcript and I tell people that, I said there are some A's and B's that I got my freshman and sophomore year, which is because I was a good memorizer. Wrote memorization, that's one characteristic of people in science especially in biology. You can give them a whole lot of information. They almost memorize that stuff verbatim from the page. Then uh, the late Dr. Brown Lawson, <laughs> my junior year in genetics, threw me for a loop. I, I guess I wasn't emotionally ready for the book. <coughs> but I got that genetics exam. I started reading those questions, and tears started to flow. From then, it's application. I may not know everything about a process, but there are some basic concepts that in any of your disciplines you need to get a strong foundation on it. Dr. Henry L. Parker, the department chair from where I was, told me this. He would say to us, work hard your freshman and sophomore year to gather knowledge, and he said that your junior year, senior year, and there beyond will be easier or lighter. The work doesn't get easier but you know how to apply and use the skills that you have learned. The other thing that I used to always tell students, crunch in those numbers. You know you all do it. You take a test, <laughs> you take a test, <laughs> crunch in those numbers. Stop trying to earn the points for an A and start with the mentality of, I'm going to understand the concept of whatever is being covered to A knowledge. I'm gonna know how to do this. And I don't care if it comes to me in the MCAT. If it comes to me in the DAT, they don't know what you, who taught you what in the school. They don't know whether you took it at Harvard or Tarrant County College. But they're saying, have you mastered the concept and can you apply what you have mastered? That's why they can put a Harvard student taking the MCAT has a degree and came back and just got the prerequisites. And you say, can you, can I make that same score? Yes, you can, because it's application. It's application, you're correct. It's application, it's application. You can do anything you put your mind to. <laughs> you can do anything that you put your mind to. Any other comments? Yes? Can you tell what, uh, how would BPC gonna go forward That is going to require, and it's, it's going to happen at the faculty level, and faculty will need to come out of their silo and go across to somebody else in another department, and they need to sit down at the table or at the desk and say, hey, how can we, how can we work collaboratively together across disciplines? It's going to have to happen at the faculty level. Um, and there's the, and that's because there's a lot of other stuff that has to be demystified. Uh, for example, um, I used to have this thing uh, in introduction to my classes, I would say, you know what always bothered me? That if I had friends and I had some friends that were like performing arts majors, 
and we were sitting around and said, what you gonna major in when you go to college? And they said performing arts, which is like, oh, English. And then somebody said, biology, chemistry, physics, ooh, you smart. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily true. Just because a person wanna be in theater does not mean that they're not, they have the intellectual capability of doing chemistry, biology, it is their chosen area. So we as, as students, as students have to do that, and faculty members have, we have to stop being critical of other people's chosen area of study and teaching. I would like to add another thing from the student perspective, um, and even from the rest of us, um, is that as students too, we have to be open um, to working with other people and being open to these concepts. Um, because basically, uh, what we're, we're, we want to do is have more uh, group work, uh, team efforts among the students so that you learn how to use your different ideas and skills uh, in the classroom to be creative uh, and, and be future forward thinking uh, in these principles, including uh, critical thinking. And it's actually called self-organizing. Uh, that's one of the terms of, for the future forward college is that you self-organize. So there's nothing stopping students from getting together and asking a faculty member for uh, support. Or um, so there's, it's really uh, opening your mind up to what's possible. Uh, and, and so just learning about these principles, going out and looking at some of these websites will give you some more ideas about uh, ways in which you can improve your skills. And it doesn't matter whether you're a student or a faculty or whatever, uh, these, uh, as long as you're alive and breathing, uh, these kinds of ideas are kind of exciting uh, and, and uh, can also bring potential uh, to problem solving and looking at our world and, and how it's changing so rapidly and how we fit into it. It also helps you not feel so nervous you know, or anxious because the change creates anxiety in us uh, and anxiety creates uh, us to freeze kind of, you know, mentally and emotionally uh, but if you open yourself up to these possibilities and see them as really positive, then when you hear something, uh, you're not quite as frightened about it because you can think, oh, well, yeah, but we're going to be able to figure this out uh, because we're going to work together. And, and the other thing I will mention to you is it's no longer an isolated United States. You know, the kind of issues we're going to deal with, we're going to be working with India and China uh, and all these other countries. And so opening yourself up to the idea that they are, they are not those boundaries also helps. And it, it, I, I don't know, I just see the science in everything, you know. I like the ballet. I'm listening to the music and I'm watching the dance. And then I look at some of the forms that they have to take and I start seeing the physics there are. I start thinking about, ooh, what is that ratio of body mass in, <laughs> in order to hold that particular pose? <laughs> They're on that TV, they're doing that. I see, I see. My students say I'm kind of crazy. <laughs> you know, sometimes when I'm eating food, I'm thinking about the chemical process that's taking place in my body. <laughs> oh, this tastes good. Why did it taste good? And then um, so my children would say, please, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, skip it, skip it. But it's just opening your mind to enjoy and to work along with others. Yes. Oh, I'd actually. One of the things we do, uh, I'm a director of instructional classroom technology for the district. And one of the things, I've always been a futurist, so when I look, I like to read sociology, and, I, and I've been studying millennials' re interaction and interactivity. They like collaboration. So the new technologies that I'm trying to put in the district demand interactivity and collaboration, whereas 10 years ago, you watch a 16 millimeter film, there's not much interaction there. But now, with interactive short throw projectors, and units that can, uh, areas that can bring Wi-Fi into the classroom and you get four or five people interacting, you have to keep up with that. The trouble is a lot, too many of my colleagues are still stuck in 1970s somewhere. And uh, that's why I, it, I cringe when I hear a faculty member tell me, well, I don't want all that stuff in my classroom. I don't want people bringing in, because they can't use that, and they're being on their Facebook. And I said, you gotta have faith to begin with. And that's how they learn how to be interactive and cooperative. You're saying yes, sir. Because I use phones all the time. I, I have them do things on their phones. There's different sure. programs called Kahoot it, where you can do reviews. Mm -hmm. So they are using their phones. You're not going to put that away, put that away, put that away. Put that away. 
But you do the U.S. I've been in universities and colleges where they actually have science. No, you know, devices that line. I'm going. I think maybe that's been there since 1980. <laughs> I, I, I was one of those teachers that said no cell phones in the classroom. I don't want to go. I was adamant about it. But the, on the students' part of this, in the learning environment, be true to what you're doing. If you're on Facebook or looking at that and you're communicating about the subject matter, that's one thing. But when I used to go in that evaluation, what I saw on those computer screens when I was sitting in the back of the classroom had nothing to do <laughs> with what was going in remotely to that. So when I got a complaint from a student saying, that instructor didn't cover that, they didn't teach you that, I said to myself, I'm going to your telephone. <laughs> were you involved in something else or were you really hurt not paying attention to that? Yes, ma'am? is that, unfortunately, the instructor doesn't know that that's what you're Googling. And that's where the conflict comes in sometimes, is where you are a studious student that will be looking up questions that's in the back of your mind. Remember, it only takes that one person to do something ridiculous, like have a conversation on that. Dr. Baker, did you? No, you want to add to her comment. <laughs> um, it'd be nice if that was asked in the class. Maybe the subject matter expert in front could start discussing that item or that issue in more detail. Because the worst thing for some faculty members is to go into a classroom and it's completely quiet for an hour and 20 minutes, and no one's engaging with you. Okay. Um, we can get ready to go. You yeah. have somewhere to go. Uh, oh, uh, I'm that kid in my uh, kinesiology class. Because I'm also a biology major, and um, so I'm really interested in how the body works. And there's a lot of things that he doesn't know, and so I'm gonna ask. And I pulled out my phone and Google it real quick. And whenever he doesn't know the answer, like five minutes later, I'm like, okay, it was this. This is what I need of the body. You know, <laughs> once in the class, the student asked a question, and I kept asking him, what's the process? What's the process? And I said, let's look at what we're talking about now, and let's see if we can figure out what would happen. I said, when we get our hypothesis as to what is occurring, we're going to go to the internet. We're gonna Google it and see how close we were. And they were shocked because they said, you know, these protein receptors, da 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 da. And I said, let's figure it out. And they were shocked at the fact that they could act, they had actually done it before they Googled it. And the Googling simply confirmed, yeah, and so forth. So there are good ways to use technology, always in the classroom. You, but remember, you have some of us that I'm slowly making that transition. We're getting there. And then there are those that are, you know, I like to engage the mind. Um, I think it's my thank you all so very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.